Being invited to address you as a, as a curator is an honor. Um, our, our curators, uh, our staff is extremely well educated and we have people uh, who are very versed in art and language working in all aspects of our museum. As a matter of fact, our telephone receptionist has a PhD in Spanish literature. So, um, and we start from there. So, <laughs> so we have uh, we have some real, really wonderfully educated people, and uh, you know, uh, people who don't, in their daily activity, act as curators um, have been participating uh, in this forum, um, and we're very honored that they have that education. If you've ever uh, typed the word curator and then done spell check, um, it's not a word that's liked. Um, I was offered the substitute crater, one who, <laughs> who puts things into crates uh, for a curator. And, and of course, we have a, a much more elevated view of, of the curator. The curator is someone who uh, has a, an affection and appreciation for objects and is able to attach those not only to ideas, but also to a whole history of ideas and other objects. So um, we're looking today at food uh, in Dali, but um, in more specifically, we're looking at the traditions of Spanish painting that inform Dali. And I, I think you'll see at the end, uh, as, as I learned when I came to the Dali Museum, that Dali is a highly traditional artist. And what makes his art so unique is not that it departs from a tradition, but it departs from a tradition that it recognizes and participates in so strongly. And uh, this is, is very similar to uh, a traditional idea of, of poetry and of music, and that is if you have a meter which sets up expectation, then any variation from it is all the more profound. So Dali's involvement in a tradition, uh, uh, which we're going to call the bodegon, uh, is, is very, very key here. So Dali is always associated uh, with food, and particularly those foods from, from his native area. And here he has a, a sea urchin. And we sometimes at the museum think of food as an entry to art because everyone eats and everyone has an appetite uh, and they can come to understand art. But equally, um, Art can be an entry to food, and I don't think I had any interest in, in eating a raw sea urchin until I, I came to the Dali Museum, and now I'm, uh, I got very curious about it and have uh, taken the plunge. Uh, here's Dali as a, as a young man with an urchin on his head. And there he is with uh, the loaf of bread, which is at once a great joke, the enlarged loaf of bread, but at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a Christian symbol, and it's fundamentally something that we all need to survive. So uh, we are nourished by food, and we are nourished by art, and, and thus the two are put together. So there's a tradition. We all know that term, still life. And throughout Western art and Asian art, it is a tradition. Uh, it has variants, and the Spanish uh, version of it is a little bit different. But still life, and in German, still leben, uh, uh, nature more in French, uh, uh, all describe this contrast between what is vital and alive and what is, is still uh, and, and uh, not vital. Uh, and in that tradition, you'll, you'll, you'll see uh, some very serious ideas. Now, I think Dolly here, as a, as a young artist, is referring not so much to his own Spanish tradition, which we'll look at uh, in a moment, but he's looking rather to uh, French Impressionism. And uh, here we're interested not so much in, in symbolism, uh, but we're interested in light and compositions, uh, slightly asymmetric compositions, and uh, the way that dashes of paint can represent the experience of the eye and light. And similarly, uh, in this painting, and in this one where you see him uh, referring to the cubism, the avant-garde art of his time. 
the tradition of, of using food to accomplish art is a, is a very ancient one. And this is a, an image of, of Archimbaldo. And uh, Archimbaldo uh, made these essential collage paintings where he created portraits uh, using uh, vegetables and fruits and, and stems and twigs and all kinds of, of natural elements. And then they actually imparted a kind of personality to, to the portrait. So it's an ancient tradition. Uh, one of the particular expressions of it is the memento mori. And, and this is the classic formulation. Uh, there is a, a lovely tulip on the left, and seemingly fresh, gleaming with moisture and life. Um, but on the opposite side is the enemy of this freshness, uh, time, uh, slipping away as grains of sand, as our lives do. And in the middle, not to let the audience miss the point, <laughs> is the result of, of uh, the end of all living things. Um, Here we have a French still life. And um, you'll see that it, it's a, a, a bit helter-skelter, as, as, um, as though the object uh, of the painting was truly to represent uh, the way a table might present itself. So uh, the natural representation it seems to be paramount. And, and here, uh, a Caravaggio, in which, again, uh, we feel the sense of, of decorative composition. It's an affirmation of, of the living and uh, the particular weight and vitality of things. But when we get from, move from Italy now to Spain, we get something quite different. And this is a Menendez still life. And uh, in it, we find something that's really characteristic of, of the Spanish uh, bodegón, which is a, a, a slight variation on the still life tradition. Bodegón is a word that came, came into currency in the late 17th century, and it, uh, it is a, a, a seller. Uh, the bodegón is uh, the seller, the, the basement where foodstuffs are kept. Uh, it's cold and, and dank, and uh, onions can be stored, and uh, root crops. Um, but the place took on the name of the tradition, which is to show comestibles. But there's something very, very particular about these Spanish bodegones, very distinct from Caravaggio's uh, interest in, in chiaroscuro and color and balance. And, uh, instead, you get this kind of grave and profound sensibility, this material presence of things that almost has a kind of religious uh, sentiment and which imposes on these objects uh, almost a spiritual uh, crystalline uh, nature. So we know that we're looking at actual vegetables, but there's something almost glowing about them which transcends their materiality. And Menendez's work uh, at that time is coincident with a lot of uh, Spanish mystical writers, usually uh, based in monasteries, uh, St. Teresa for one. And then you get, and I hope that's not too pixelated, it's off the internet, um, you get uh, uh, Sanchez Cotan, Cortan, uh, Sanchez Cotan, excuse me, um, compositions, and uh, these, are, I think, are the, the highest expression of this tradition uh, that you'll see that Dali, in a sense, uh, ascribes to. So you have this geometrical precision of arrangement uh, which suggests the golden mean. You can sense that there is some inherent order that surpasses the kind of space that vegetables normally and fruits would, would command uh, as though they are part of this divine order um, and these humble vegetables get this, again, this kind of crystalline gleam. Um, 
And, and what is spiritual here is that you have this contrast. You have a spatial timelessness, the kind of timelessness we have outside uh, with the pavers showing the golden rectangle, this timeless form in which everything small is related to everything larger and vice versa. So you have this spatial timelessness uh, in contrast intersecting with uh, this feeling of uh, temporal, um, temporal reality. And so uh, this conflict between what could be eternal in this composition and what we know is already an infected with bacteria and all the elements of mortality in which will slump and rot soon creates a very, very curious feeling. And uh, it's, a very, it's a very Spanish feeling, the sense of life in death, death in life. And you see it in, in many aspects of, of Spanish culture. Uh, William Jeffett is here. He's a great aficionado of the bullfight. And, and that's another example uh, of that life in death, death in life. So uh, Sanchez Cotan uh, created this form. And, and this is a painting that probably every artist in, in Spain has studied since Cotan's day, uh, including Salvador Dali. And you can see when he makes this uh, portrait of, of uh, loaf of bread, uh, in addition to his innovations with the, the sexual uh, elements and the element of, of time, um, has the same composition as the Cotan. And of course, uh, this is also participating in the tradition of the memento mori because um, what is firm one moment becomes flaccid another moment, uh, <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> And the drooping of, uh, of the clocks is, is an important element. And, and uh, in interestingly, another Sanchez Cotan, uh, again, that same composition, um, one of the important elements you'll notice is that there's always this ledge, which uh, does two things. It provides a, a, a formal compositional element, but it also makes reference to the altar. And so uh, it, it, it gives you the sense of of sacrifice, of, of uh, a sacrament as well. So one way of, of uh, looking at this is to contrast the mineral and the organic uh, in this tradition um, and to understand that there is a discussion between them, the prodigious pro, uh, dialectic. So Here's Dali's wonderful basket of bread of which we're so proud. And uh, you can see all the, the elements, the, the luminosity, um, the care with composition from upper left to lower right, the sort of diagonal movement. And of course, the religious uh, iconography, the bread being the body of Christ, and then uh, the veil, um, which refers, of course, to Veronica's veil and, and Christ's image imprinted on it. Um, so we talked about uh, food as, as nutritive, and uh, Dolly had always mentioned that we all begin as eggs. Uh, we all start out as in the ovum. Um, but here again, you get this lovely contrast between what seems to be an act actually exaggerated interest in geometry and architecture here, uh, and then the, the very uh, organic uh, image in the center. So. Uh, eggs on a plate without the plate, um, his playful description. Um, but that very tender, soft thing in the middle, organic, contrasted um, with the mineral and uh, expressed through that interest in geometry, which is so characteristic of the Bougadon. Uh, Dolly's further interest in eggs and his interest in the subject of, <clears throat> of Christian uh, iconography and transcendence. Uh, this painting, which we will uh, use our resources as soon as we can garner them to, to reglaze. You notice when you go upstairs and look at this painting that there's a, a lot of reflection. Uh, this, this glass that we've been using to re reglaze our, our paintings is, 
extremely expensive and we have a project to slowly make sure that all the paintings are, are glazed with this non-reflective, non-refractive um, glass. But um, you can enjoy the painting still. Um, and you see that it's Christian iconography, the, the bread, uh, the loaves, and the fish. Uh, and then there's um, the veil uh, holding them. But you see also that glow. So there's a geometric arrangement, again, which gives the sense of, of, of uh, spatial timelessness. And then the, the living objects, the bread becomes stale, the fish rots. Uh, and we're reminded uh, at once of the glory of material life and its peril. Um, this is Dolly's Last Supper. Um, we frequently get suggestions from our visitors. You should borrow this painting. It's a great painting uh, at the National Gallery. And doggone it, we can't. Um, um, we have... They're very good lawyers in the world, but uh, they have not been able to shake loose the, the uh, Chester Dale bequest at the National Gallery, and, and his will stipulated that none of his paintings that would ever leave the National Gallery. Um, that doesn't mean they have to tuck it under the fire escape, which, uh, where they've had it by the elevators for years. Um, they move it around. The, the curators don't like it, and the public votes it every year as their favorite painting. <laughs> um, and, and once again, uh, Dolly, to, to emphasize, uh, well, the painting emphasizes Dolly's participation in this tradition where you get the spatial timelessness through and highly emphasized geometry. In this case, uh, Peter, what is that form? Uh, thank you. The dodecahedron is on the tip of my tongue. The, the dodecahedron, which Dolly identified it as uh, a, a perfect form and one that had lots of spiritual implications because of its relation to the pentagram and the pentagram to the golden mean. Uh, but there you have the Last Supper and uh, uh, Christ's body uh, actually being identified with that geometry uh, that overarches the scene. And again, the uh, emphasi emphasis on geometry. This is a, a painting which in, um, if you, um, you know, the, the golden section is a mathematical relation, 1.67 something to one. And if you mark the edges of, the four edges of this painting with points one and 1.67, and then connected them across, you would get this amazing intersection that corresponds exactly to where these objects are. So Dali was uh, observing um, Renaissance procedures, the, the, the great grand tradition of composition using geometry, uh, not because it makes it easier and not because um, you have to have some place to start, but because there's an inherent power in those relationships and they have a suggestion of elevating the temporal to the eternal uh, and the material to the spiritual. So this is Dali's Natural More Vivant, which is upstairs and one of our uh, most wonderful paintings. Um, I think you can see really well on, in this slide, too, uh, in the upper left, this uh, dot pattern, uh, this sort of prima materia that, that the world uh, is composed of something, some substance beyond um, what we recognize as material form. There's some uh, underlying grid that frames all space and time, and, and Dali uh, borrowed that idea. He found it resonant with his own spiritual values, but he borrowed that idea from, uh, from uh, physics and the discoveries of atomic structure. And of course, his other reference to physics here is in that Heisenberg uncertainty principle where uh, it's postulated that one thing can exist in two places simultaneously. Um, well, this is a dinner jacket. That's the connection. Um, and, and this is aphrodisiac dinner jacket. So one of the, um, one of Dali's relations to this tradition is to always, you know, have fun and uh, to have uh, linguistic references that connect to his painting, just as the mystical painters of the Bodegon in the 17th century uh, were referring to mystical writers. 
And uh, I think this slide needs no explanation. <laughs> nor this. <laughs> uh, and uh, Peter Tush was kind enough to loan me this slide from one of his presentations on a similar subject. Um, here you have um, civil war described as auto-cannibalism. And this, this creature is cutting itself apart and devouring itself, which is, uh, you know, I think one of the most incredibly powerful metaphors for civil war. Um, and do you remember uh, that this is called uh, soft construction with boiled beans? Uh, down below at the uh, bottom, there are a few boiled beans. And uh, Peter's also pointed out that Dolly had said that it's impossible to consider eating that much meat without some vegetables. <laughs> This painting is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and uh, it was painted the year before Guernica. Uh, you know, we, we don't like to uh, you know, tout Dali's uh, superiority to other artists, but uh, <laughs> it, is, it is wonderful that we can say uh, at, at least he wasn't influenced by Picasso, <laughs> in this case. And uh, Dali's you know, personality was such that he was very convivial and liked to dine. Uh, uh, here he is in the, in the 60s with uh, his young entourage uh, enjoying a good meal. We were told a, a, lo a lovely anecdote by one of our board members. The ambassador of Spain to the United States is on our board. And his first assignment in the United States was as cultural attache in, in New York. And, of course, Dolly in the late 60s is in New York. I think this is probably in New York, this photo. And uh, he was directed by the ambassador uh, as cultural attache, you must take Mr. Dolly to lunch and, you know, keep good relations with him, remind him that he's a Spaniard. <laughs> and, uh, so he invited Dolly to lunch, and, and Dolly said, yes, yes, and, and it never happened. So he invited him again and again and again. And finally, he got a call, and uh, the call said, Mr. Dali will meet you for lunch at Le Grenoy at 2 o'clock. And so he went to uh, Le Grenoy, and in came Dali and eight friends. And Le Grenoy uh, is probably the, was the most expensive restaurant in, in New York. And uh, our ambassador, 28 years old then, uh, <laughs> uh, also Le Grenoy, does not take credit cards. <laughs> so uh, uh, he, he uh, did have a Rolex watch, however, and he had to leave that till he could go and, and uh, pay for the lunch after uh, Dolly's entourage had a lovely time. Lots of champagne. Um, food is so important to, to Dolly, and, and Peter has, has touched on this in his presentations, the kind of uh, idea of, of art uh, as, as having a digestive aspect. And Dolly's saying that uh, um, consuming the world was the way he approached um, making, making paintings. Um, and it's only natural then that he would pay attention to the accoutrements of, of food just as he did to the accoutrements and the, tech, the tools of painting in his uh, 50 Secrets of Magic Painting, which many of you have recently read. Uh, so this is this, this wonderful uh, set of cutlery, which I really think it would be nice if the foundation would release uh, uh, some replicas of. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we've seen Dolly referencing this work, and it's really critical. I had the pleasure of seeing it last week in Bilbao, and this is a, a Zubaran painting of, uh, of uh, Veronica's veil. And you, you all know the story of how Christ was uh, carrying his cross to Calvary, and it stumbled, and Veronica stepped forward with her, her veil and uh, blotted the sweat from his face. And when she pulled it away, there was the image of Christ. And... Uh, so Dali's referring to that, uh, but he's, he's referring to this, um, this idea of the power of the, the magical properties of, of images. 
and uh, really the almost holiness of, of painting that, uh, that Christ would reveal himself uh, in color in an image on a piece of cloth, which is essentially what painters do. One of the really fun <coughs> works that's uh, in William Jeffett's uh, exhibition upstairs in the Huff Wing uh, is Le Dine de Gala, and this is a, a series of images. That, this is the book itself that, that uh, Dolly made for a cookbook, and his principal collaborator was the uh, very popular Parisian chef of the 60s, Maxime's. We've all heard of Maxime's of Paris. Uh, they made food that was later shown to kill people uh, uh, with cholesterol. And, uh, <laughs> um, but it, at that time, it was uh, highly coveted. Um, lots of mayonnaise, uh, lots of richness. And, and Dolly had a great time making images uh, of the various stages of preparation of this food. And, and here he, takes, he finds the, uh, the veil of Veronica... The, the impression of Christ from a chicken. Uh, it's terribly irreverent, but I think very funny. As, as well. And um, this is, uh, uh, proposes to be a, a, an aspic uh, constructed of people's bodies down below, uh, very Hieronymus Bosch-like um, but then the recipes are actual recipes from Maxime's. And, and I think we, we made one for one dinner one time that was a, a, a meatloaf with a hard-boiled egg in the middle. So every slice had a, a cross-section of an egg as she went through it. And, and here's a lovely terrine uh, made of, <laughs> of a collage with a, a toothbrush and uh, some very white teeth. It was taken from a magazine. Um, I think we see this, this fascination with food, and again, we'll harken back to that relation between the mineral and the organic here in uh, uh, three sardines, telephone and three sardines uh, in late September, uh, a painting from 1939, in which Dali's putting together, and, and, and look at the profound uh, and strict geometry again, harkening back to Cotan and the way that strong geometry can give you the sense of fixed and perpetual time and uh, a particular moment in disintegration. So there's a, a, a woman in the background with the jump rope, which is a frozen moment in time, uh, the shadows, and then the, the three sardines and the telephone. So the mineral and the organic, but also uh, we see this fascination uh, as food as a com in, in relation to communication. And um, we have the telephone, which is at once something that goes to the ear, but also to the mouth, communication as its connection to food, and the sardine. Uh, and similarly, the same theme uh, here with lobster telephone, with the uh, telephone and, and the, or the organic and, and the mineral the, uh, the nutritive and the communicative. And uh, I think the more we understand that, that Dali has identified and participated in a tradition, the more we can uh, value his departure from that and the power of his imagination and his ability to create uh, things that are astoundingly new because they refer to things that are not new. And that's my... Uh, thesis here. So thank you. And <laughs> yes, Vicki. Can you tell us about the Spanish innovation with molecular cuisine? You started the internet first and then I think you said that you were Okay, yes. Um, the, the chef that we invited, uh, Paco Perez, uh, came out of uh, the famous restaurant uh, Bouilly, El Bouilly, uh, which is in a town that's even closer to Figueres called Rosas. And uh, this 
this tradition um, of, of molecular gastronomy um, has been, for the last decade, the, the avant-garde of, of cooking. And it refers, in the same way Dali does, to physics and molecular biology with his interest in DNA. Uh, it refers to chemical processes. So they use liquid nitrogen, uh, for instance, to transform things. Uh, we had a little pieces of, of foie gras that were uh, frozen with liquid nitrogen and turned into these tiny little crystals that, uh, like little flavor buds, that you put them on your tongue and you would, without having more than you know half a gram, you could get this incredible taste of uh, foie gras. And it, so it, it's a it's a metamorphic uh, concept of changing things, not only. Uh, whether they're solid, liquid, uh, many of the things are presented as foams. You'll get uh, vegetables that are turned into a foam, and they'll have all the flavor of asparagus or artichoke, but it's, it's like a little spin drift off the water, this, this foam. So there's this idea of metamorphosis, changing the shape of something and keeping its uh, flavor, once, one part of its identity, the same. Uh, so it's very similar to uh, Dolly's fascination with, uh, with metamorphosis and shifting shapes and the elasticity of the identity of things. That one thing is not just rigidly what we un understand it to be, but has aspects of something else. Uh, and this, uh, this spread from, uh, from El Bouilly, which is in Catalonia, uh, up to the Basque region now, and I think uh, the city of San Sebastian, Spain, has more uh, Michelin-starred restaurants than Paris or New York. So that's the new center. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I think last year in this world competition uh, restaurant in Copenhagen got the prize, but but it also was doing the same kinds of things. Thanks for bringing that up, Vicky. Could I answer any questions from someone who's not a plant? <laughs> yes. Well, it's uh, well, it's a perfect it's a perfect example of his interest in contrasting the uh, le dur et le mou. So the art side, the hard and the soft. The, the outside, you know, is a spiny shell. Uh, and the inside is mushy. It's like pudding. It's like a, a fish pudding. Yes. Yeah, well, the manly Spaniards just put them in there. You know, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I used a spoon. Yes, it's very salty. Uh, but it's mostly mushy. It tastes... Uh, it tastes like uh, if you had a blender and you mixed uh, mushrooms and snails. What? I'm sorry, I had to do that. To you. <laughs> I once worked in, a, when I was a young man, I worked in a medical laboratory, and we were doing an experiment trying to find the effect of certain pesticides uh, on mice so that we would know whether they damaged the organs of human beings. Now, um, I don't think it's a, it's a very necessary practice anymore, but at that time it was, it was done. And uh, rather than the dissect the, the mouse's liver, which is they're very, very small, um, we would uh, put the mouse in liquid nitrogen and then put it in a blender with some benzene. And uh, we'd extract the, the pesticide in that way. And it's a little bit like that. <laughs> yes? How was it decided that St. Petersburg would be the place for a doll museum? Um, I think it was a divine. <laughs> uh, it, it's a lovely story. Um, um, I think many here could tell the story more efficiently than, than I could. But it, it, in short, um, the, collect, the founders of the collection, Eleanor and Reynolds Morse, were doing the state planning and discussed uh, the disposition of their collection put together over the four decades uh, with principal institutions. And 
they weren't getting the response they wanted. Uh, and the Wall Street Journal uh, reported on this in, a, in an article entitled The Art World Dilly Dallies with the Dollies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, uh, a lawyer who is still on the board of the Dolly Museum saw that article in the Wall Street Journal and uh, brought together a committee of uh, people who made a presentation to Morris and convinced them to bring the collection here. And they provided that, our old building, uh, for them. And we were in that building from uh, when we opened in 1982 uh, until uh, 2011 last year. Today's the anniversary. Today is the anniversary, thank you, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Tell me where, what you're thinking of. With well, for the sample of Paul's eye. That's okay. You've got a lot to see at the time. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, I, I think in that case, he's, he's really interested in, uh, he's really interested in the way an image, uh, the kind of multiplicity, the diverse way you can read the world as one thing or another. So he does, he wants to show you that you have to search. When, when you find an image, you in a sense, created it. Negative space, you know, is uh, I, it's a term that I'm, I'm sometimes puzzled by because I don't think there is such a thing. I mean, there's there's uh, there's space, uh, but if you think of the the, the old trope of the uh, profile uh, that's a chalice, um, it's a two profiles where it's a chalice, and you can see the positive or the negative. <coughs> uh, I, I think that's the principle that when we talk about negative space, we're talking about that that other form that we think of as background. Dolly's main, the main points of his art is that, is that all these spaces are contending in the same ground for your attention, and you choose which image you see and, and how you construe the world. And that's our lesson in our education programs, really, to, to our, our visitors, particularly you know, our first-time visitors and our, our students, is that um, the world isn't this way or that way um, on its own. It's as we create it in our, using our, our Experience and our eyes and our imaginations, and we can we can create a much more interesting world, and we can be much more flexible in the way we approach the way the world is, and, and consequently the way we are, uh, than we often do. And, and, and that's a lovely lesson to be able to present to our public. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.